Let's get started. So, last time we saw uh, definitions of the complexity classes uh, EXP, uh, NAXP, and so on. So, today we will start by looking at, uh, uh, at a technique by which we can translate a collapse of a class uh, in some lower level to collapse of uh, classes in some higher level. Okay. So, let me mention the theorem and then it will be clearer. Okay. So, if p is equal to n p, then we can show that E x p is equal to NEXP. Okay. So, if I can show a collapse of uh, these two classes in the that is in the polynomial time setting, uh, I can show that even in the exponential time setting the analogous classes collapse. Or if you look at the contrapositive variant of this theorem, if you can show that these two classes are not the same, then that would imply that P and NP are not the same. Okay. So, this is not uh, very difficult to prove, uh, let us just uh, see how the proof goes. Okay. So, let uh, L be a language in any XP. Okay. So, what does that mean? That means that there exist a non deterministic Turing machine uh, M such that uh, L is equal to L of M and uh, for all inputs x, m runs for at most 2 to the x to the uh, so order of 2 to the x to the power c steps okay, for some constant c that is the definition. So, what we will do is from L we will construct a new language which uh, we will call L pad. Okay. So, this language uh, L pad is uh, the, the language of all tuples of the form uh, let us say a string x comma uh, the string of all ones uh, having length that is 1 to the power uh, 2 to the power size of x to the power c. Okay. So, you take the string x and concatenate it with 2 to the power x to the power c ones uh, and which, which are the x's that we consider for all x's that belong to L. So, what can we say about this language L pad? So, we know that L belongs to any x p. What can we say in uh, more specifically in which class do you think this language will lie? So, we always count the running time as a function of the input size. So, what are we doing here essentially? We are just adding some uh, extra characters to the input. Okay. So, characters that we do not use, but uh, 
uh, some exponential number of ones. So, basically the reason why we do it is that, so that we can show that L pad will belong to NP and that is not very difficult to see. So, what we do is, how do we construct an NP machine for L pad? So, L pad is in NP. Since we can do the following. So, first given let us say a string z, okay. so we are just given a string z, check if z is of the form uh, some string y followed by 1 to the power 2 to the power uh, size of y to the power c 1s. Okay. So, first check that the given string has this form or not, scan through the input and do this and then if it has this form, uh, simulate uh, the machine uh, m on y okay. and output the answer. Okay. So, what is the running time of this machine, the new machine that we are constructing? So, first we are just scanning the input from left to right that is uh, if the input has length z that takes order z steps and then we are just simulating m on this string y. So, we know that m runs for at most uh, 2 to the power y to the power c steps. So, the second step will also be order z right. So, that is why this entire computation it is a non deterministic computation because m is non deterministic but the good thing is that now it is linear in the size of the input, the running time of whatever this machine. So, we can give a name to this machine. So, let us say that this is a some m prime. So, now what can we say? We know that by our hypothesis p is equal to n p, therefore, l pad belongs to p as well. Okay and uh, from that we get that L belongs to E x p, because if L pad belongs to p, take the deterministic polynomial time Turing machine that uh, decides L pad okay, and uh, just use that same machine to det uh, determine whether an input belongs to x or not. So, that will still be exponential in the size of the input. Yes, so okay, so I kind of brushed over it, but if you just think for it a while, you will understand. So, so if L pad belongs to P, so that will happen. So, so what does it mean to say that L pad belongs to P? It implies that there exists a some Turing machine, uh, let us say N a deterministic polynomial time Turing machine n, which decides L pad. What does it mean to say that n is polynomial? It is polynomial in the size of z, right. So, now what I do is that given this Turing machine n, uh, I just skip the first step. So, I just take this Turing machine n and from there I construct another Turing machine uh, n prime which just uh, skips the first step and uh, takes an input for L and just does the rest whatever n prime was doing. So, what I mean is that you do just do not need to look at these bits any longer, you can just look at the, uh, the y part and then uh, output your answer. Okay. So, yeah, so this technique is uh, 
known as padding in complexity theory, because essentially what we are doing is we are padding the given input by a uh, kind of a redundant string uh, of a certain length. I mean in certain cases where we are showing a result like this, that is we want to cascade, uh, I mean we want to translate a result which holds for some smaller class to uh, some larger class. So, one of the aims or one of the uh, goals of complexity theory is to prove separation between two complexity classes, right. So, and this is not always possible, I mean uh, in fact we know very little about separation results, but uh, among the few that we do know, okay. so we will discuss one today and uh, this is what is known as the time hierarchy theorem. And the technique that this theorem uses to prove uh, that two complexity classes are separate is something that all of you actually have seen okay, in your uh, TOC course. Basically this uses the technique of diagonalization. So, when uh, uh, you saw that uh, the halting problem or some other problem is undecidable that is not uh, computable using a Turing machine, uh, you saw the technique of diagonalization, right, where you thought of uh, strings as machines and then you flipped uh, uh, the diagonal elements and got a language which was not decidable by any Turing machine. So, th that is the technique that uh, we also use here. So, let me state the theorem first. So, let f n and g n be two time constructible functions such that f of n times log of f of n is in small o of g of n. Then what we can show is that the uh, the classes, the time classes that are determined by the functions f of n and g of n are separate basically. That is d time f of n is strictly contained. So, this is the notation uh, for strict containment in d time g of n. So, what this means is that there is a language in d time g of n that is not present in d time f of n. Okay. And this is true if uh, we have time constructible functions which satisfy uh, this criteria. That is uh, g of n is strictly larger than f of n times log of f of n. Okay. So, just uh, uh, note that this is small o of g of n, this is not big O. So, small o means that it is strictly larger. For example, if you take, uh, can look at some small examples, if you have uh, f of n is equal to n and uh, g of n is equal to n square, then we can make this statement that there are languages in 
d time n square which are not present in d time n. Okay. But uh, this again, again I mean this hierarchy theorem is nice, I mean it does show that uh, certain complexity classes are separate, but again we cannot always use it. For example, we cannot use it to show uh, things like p n and p are separate, okay, because one thing is that they both are polynomial time machines. Okay. So, it does not show uh, separation between deterministic and non-deterministic versions of the same function. So, before I begin the proof of this theorem, uh, let us uh, look at some points. So, we know that uh, again from our uh, from the uh, from uh, our TOC course that uh, there is a universal Turing machine which is capable of simulating any Turing machine right. So, it has uh, it can take any Turing machine and an input for that machine and it can simulate it uh, on the universal Turing machine. So, we can say something little more than uh, just uh, bare simulation we can say something about the time taken by the universal Turing machine as well. So, a Turing machine M on an input x can be simulated by the uh, universal Turing machine, uh, let us say we will call it u, uh, with at most a logarithmic amount of time overhead. Okay. So, let me make this uh, more formal what we mean here. So, that is uh, if m holds on x in at most or say in in t steps okay then you can simulate m on x in at most uh, some constant c times t times uh, log t steps. Okay. So, this is a constant which is dependent on the uh, on the parameters of the Turing machine m that is what is its alphabet size, how many states does it have and uh, what is the nature of its transition function. Okay, which are all constants. I mean, they do not depend on what is the length of the input. But uh, apart from that, if m uh, can simulate x in t steps, then uh, if I am uh, using the universal Turing machine to simulate m on x, then that will take just an multiplicative factor of log t number of steps to do the same simulation. Okay. every Turing machine can be represented by infinitely many steps. 
strings. Okay. Why is this true? So, we always I mean we know that we can fix an encoding of a binary string, so that every string encodes a Turing machine. right? But uh, on the converse, if I look at a Turing machine, then I claim that it can be represented by infinitely many strings. I mean that same encoding scheme uh, satisfies this property as well. So, after you take a Turing machine and encode it by some particular string, okay, you just uh, pad it with some arbitrary number of ones. So, basically the encoding that you now I mean the string that you now get will represent the same Turing machine just by ignoring the ones. I mean it is the same as looking at uh, let us say program. So, suppose if you have a C program, it does not matter what that program I mean if you plug in comments into that C program, you can plug any length I mean any number of comments of any length and that will not change what that program does. Okay. So, there are infinitely many C programs which does the same thing basically by just plugging in arbitrary length comments. So, that is the meaning of this statement. Okay. So, yeah and as a notation we will just use the following that So, given a binary string x, let m of x denote the Turing machine. Uh, corresponding to x. Okay. So, let us uh, go ahead and prove the theorem. So, actually again I mean uh, what we will prove is not the general case for any arbitrary f n and g n. So, we will uh, basically prove the theorem for a particular choice of f n and g n. So, we will uh, assume that f of n is uh, n and uh, g of n is something like n to the power 1.5 and then we will prove the theorem. And the general case is actually uh, I mean we will follow the same idea as we shall see. Okay. So, we will uh, construct a language L such that L is in d time n to the power 1.5, but L does not belong to d time n. So, how do we define this language? Uh, so, we will define a Turing machine D. So, we will construct a Turing machine D as follows. on input x, what d does is the following. So, it simulates x on m of x uh,
using the universal Turing machine u for n to the power some 1.4 steps ok. I mean some number that is uh, smaller than this ok. And uh, yeah, so the crucial point here is that uh, it does not carry on this simulation uh, for an arbitrary amount of time ok. Even if m x does not halt on x after n to the power 1.4 uh, steps, uh, this machine d would halt ok. And it will output the following. So, if m of x rejects uh, x, then go ahead and accept. Otherwise, reject. Okay. So, if within one n to the power 1.4 steps m of x rejects x, then uh, d would accept. And uh, if uh, either m of x accepts x or if m of x uh, does not output anything on x within this many number of steps, then you go ahead and reject in both the cases. So, what can we say about the language defined by d? So, can we say this that L of d is in d time n to the power 1.5. So, we can say this right because by definition we are running this for at most this many number of steps ok. So, therefore, L of d uh, belongs to this uh, time class. Now, uh, suppose for and basically what we will show is that L of d does not belong to d time n ok. So, for the sake of contradiction, suppose uh, let me also in short just refer this to as L. Suppose L belongs to d time n as well. It means that there exists a Turing machine M such that for all strings x, M of x is equal to D of x and m runs for at most some constant c times uh, the size of x number of steps ok. So, since we are assuming that L is in d time n. So, now what we will do is we will simulate I mean since we were doing it for the case of d I mean there. So, we will simulate m using the universal Turing machine uh, u So, if we simulate m using the universal Turing machine u, then it uh, 
halt in at most uh, some c prime times c x times log x number of steps right so this comes from this observation where now this uh, c prime is basically this uh, constant capital c that we had earlier yeah so what can we say about uh, the asymptotic nature of uh, these two functions so there exist some constant n not such that for all n greater than or equal to n not c prime c n log n is strictly smaller than n to the power 1.4. Okay. So, this is the place where uh, we use the fact that uh, we have a function which is uh, asymptotically larger than a logarithmic factor of uh, the given function. Okay. So, let z be a string representing uh, the machine m such that z has length at least as large as n naught. Okay. That is the cardinality of z satisfies this inequality. So, why can again we assume that uh, such a z would exist? So, now uh, So, now let us observe the following. So, what is the output of this machine m on z? Okay. So, what is happening to the output of m on z? So, by definition, so if you look at the definition of uh, d that we have here, okay, m on z is uh, so if m on z rejects then d accepts z and uh, Otherwise, d rejects z. Therefore, for this particular z, what we have that m of z and d of z, they do not output the same answer by our construction. Okay. And this is a contradiction, because what we should have had is that this language uh, I mean the, this machine should accept the same language that is for all strings x m of x should have been equal to d of x, but now for this particular string that we have exhibited they have different output values. Okay. And now as an exercise you can uh, show the proof for general oops, f and g. Okay. I mean it is basically the same, I mean instead of uh, 
choosing these two particular functions, if you take general f n g, uh, I mean the same kind of argument holds, but you have to be a little bit careful. So, let me ask a question at this point. So, initially we assumed that uh, the functions are time constructible, exactly. So, over here we are using that the function g of n is time constructible, because so you are given this function g n right. Now, you are given an input x, how can you run uh, x on the uh, machine m of x for this many number of steps, if you do not know what the value of that function is. So, since you can compute that g of n in order g of n time, okay, which we implicitly are assuming here. So, this is I have not stated here, but uh, we have the implicit understanding that uh, we know what the value of this function here is, because this is the function uh, g of n. So, given n we know what how to compute g of n and that is why we can do this particular simulation. This inequality might not hold right. So, there can be a particular n for which c prime c n log n is greater than n to the power 1.4. So, for that we do not even complete this thing. So, it is only for those uh, particular string where we can complete this particular string, uh, this particular computation that we can claim this result. So, this uh, again I mean as you can see is using the technique of uh, diagonalization, so, but this is kind of different from uh, let us say the diagonalization argument where we showed the halting problem is not uh, decidable, because there we were uh, there uh, we had enumerated all particular machines, but here our enumeration is slightly different although we are enumerating an infinite number of machines, but we are only enumerating those machines which run for this much amount of steps. So, that is the key observation. So, let us look at another uh, concept. So, the concept of oracle Turing machines. So, I will define this and I will uh, state a result, but I would not prove it. I mean if you are interested proof is in your textbook, but some important to understand what is happening. So, what is an oracle Turing machine? So, an oracle Turing machine is just like an ordinary Turing machine, I mean it can be deterministic or non deterministic. So, we have a Turing machine M, okay. but in addition to this it has an extra tape, okay. so it has a extra tape which is uh, referred to as the oracle tape. So, this is a read write tape, so that is you can read from this tape as well as you can write on to this tape and the machine has three extra states. So, it has a state q query, it has a state q uh, let us call it yes and it has a state q no. So, the idea is as follows, the idea is that what we want to do is that now we want to look at Turing machines which can query to some black box. So, a black box is you can think of it as a closed box of uh, some language that we do not know and what this black box is capable of doing is if you provide this black box some string in one step it will tell you whether that string belongs to that corresponding language or not. So, suppose if you have a black box for uh, the language sat, you provide the black box if uh, boolean formula phi and it will tell you whether phi is satisfiable or not. Okay. So, that is the idea that we want to uh, formalize and represent it using Turing machines. So, the Turing machine has an oracle tape uh, and it has these three extra states and uh, there is uh, some language. So, this is the oracle subset of 0 1 star such that whenever the Turing machine m enters into the state q query at any point during its computation, in the next step 
the machine will go to either the state q y or the state q n depending on what is written on this oracle state. So, the moment uh, m enters q query, it checks what is written on the oracle tape. If the string that is written on the oracle tape belongs to this language, so there is a fixed language o, it will immediately go to q yes and if that string does not belong to the language, it will go to q no. Okay. And that is what and then it will proceed. And the good part is that, so that is, we just count that as one computation step. So, maybe this O is a very complex language, I mean it has very high complexity. Nevertheless, uh, we just uh, think of going from this state Q query to either the state Q y or Q n as just one computation step. Okay. So, that is the reason why we have this black box picture in mind. So, now we can define uh, complexity classes uh, based on this Turing machine model. So, let me just define this class p to the o. Okay. So, let o be some language, okay. then the class p to the o is the set of all languages that are decided by a polynomial time time Turing machine M with oracle access to O. So, I formally did not define what it means to say that a Turing machine has an oracle access to a language, but this is basically what the idea is. So, I have a Turing machine and it has oracle access to this particular language. So, then p to the power o is the set of all languages that uh, uh, can be decided by such Turing machines. So, analogously uh, we have n p to the power o as well for any oracle o. And in fact, this can be extended to any complexity class. If you have any complexity class, you can think of uh, an oracle for that complexity class and the class of languages that are defined uh, by this uh, notion. So, now let us, uh, let me state the result that I, that I mentioned earlier. So, is this clear what uh, this notion means? So, then what we can show is that the classes P and N P I mean for the classes P and N P, there exist oracles with respect to which they are the same and there exist oracles with respect to which they are different. And this was a result that was shown uh, in 1975 by Baker, Gill and uh, Soloway. So, kind of immediately after this theory of N P completeness uh, uh, picked up speed. Yeah, so, this was in 1975. So, there exist languages A and B such that P to the power A is equal to N P to the power A and P to the power B is not equal to n p to the power b. So, the first part of this theorem is not very difficult to show. So, if you just think for a while, you should get uh, what a we should consider. 
So, what do you think uh, would be a suitable A? So, the intuition is that A should be some very hard language, right. I mean, in other words, A should have complexity that is much larger than uh, P and NP. So, that it would not matter if we, uh, I mean, what the base classes are in some sense. What you should choose A to be some language in EXP? Right. So, if you choose A to be some language in EXP, we know that N P is a subset of EXP and P is a subset of EXP. Right. So, it really does not matter what the base machines are doing. If you give it any string, uh, well uh, it has access to such a powerful oracle. So, basically it can decide anything that is in EXP. So, it still I mean it still requires proof why these two uh, uh, would be the same. But uh, the idea essentially is that if you pick A to be let us say a language in EXP, uh, the equality holds. The more difficult part is to show this that what language do you pick uh, as B such that these two classes are not the same. Because if you pick B to be something very hard, then they would be the same. If you pick B to be something very easy, then oracle does not help you much. Right. So, it has to be something of intermediate difficulty and uh, this is where again the idea of diagonalization is used. So, we construct a B uh, again uh, in an iterative manner using diagonalization. Okay. So, we have a matrix and we flip the diagonal bits and we construct this language. So, that uh, we get a suitable B. Okay. So, this proof again if you are interested you can uh, look at the book, uh, it is not very difficult, but yeah it is good to know. Okay, so we will stop here.